morning from San Francisco. I'm Ken Ben Muller. It's a pleasure to contribute to this hybrid 2021 SGI meeting. I'll be speaking on EUS guided drainage for walled off necroses. Endoscopic drainage of pancreatic fluid collections has been an evolution over nearly half a century now. The first report of endoscopic uh, drainage, in this case aspiration, was in 1975. This was followed by the development of endoscopic techniques to drain a pseudocyst, first with fistulotomy, later with placement of plastic stents. And then in 1992, the uh, first use of endoscopic ultrasound to guide the drainage of a pseudocyst. Uh, I was working with Nipsa Hendra at the time and we reported this case. In the, this millennia, we have seen the development of techniques and strategies to treat walled off necroses. And the most recent development has been the LAMS, the Lumen Opposing Metal Stent, um, which I reported on in 2012. You're familiar with the Atlanta classification. It was revised in 2012. And this has guided the treatment of pancreatic fluid collections by what I call the three Ds. We're dealing with an acute fluid or necrotic collection less than four weeks old. We will delay treatment. If it's a pseudocyst with a mature wall consisting only of fluid, then we drain. If we're dealing with walled off necroses, then we will debride, and this can be indirect debridement, irrigation, or direct debridement, necrosectomy. Our first step is to access the pancreatic fluid collection, and we have historically used the Seldinger over the wire a technique borrowed from our interventional radiologist. Access the cyst with the FNA needle, insert a guide wire. And then over the guide wire, we dilate the tract with a balloon or a bougie and then replace the balloon or bougie with one or more stents to drain the cyst. The Seldinger technique has worked well, but it does have drawbacks. Uh, it is time consuming and requires um, multiple over the wire exchanges and if the wire pulls back, we will lose access to the cyst. Being multi-step, it is also multi-risk. So as soon as we remove the needle, we have a gap between the guide wire and the tract, and this can result in leak. If we insert a dilator then over the wire, this can displace the cyst from the ball wall. If we dilate over the wire, this can result in perforation. Once we remove the dilator, we now have a larger gap between the guide wire and the tract, again, leak. And finally, when we place our stents, this can also result in displacement of the cyst from the uh, ball wall. And of course, perforation is the most dreaded uh, complication that can result. And uh, I've experienced uh, these complications many times, uh, and this inspired me to develop an alternative non seldinger access to cysts with a one device, single puncture and exchange free platform. Uh, and this is the LAMS using the LAMS. We access the target lumen with a device loaded catheter. So you see here our uh, catheter with the LAMS loaded already in the catheter. And then thanks to these micro wires that allow us to apply a cautery uh, during puncture of the cyst, we can enter into the cyst and immediately deploy the device and we avoid any over the wire exchange and thereby avoid, avoid any risk of leak. The electrocautery enhanced delivery system uh, is an important component of this platform. It has a ceramic bougie shaped tip as you can see here and the cautery microwires running along the side and then converging at the tip. Such a non sodinger approach is of course most important when we're dealing with cysts that have indeterminate adherence to the wall. How can we determine adherence? 
On EUS, we see an echogenic layer between the cyst and the wall. And this is a bright layer, which consists of fat. The cyst will also move independent from the wall. For example, when we apply pressure on the abdomen. So we look to see whether both the cyst and the wall are moving uh, together. Stent drainage has uh, evolved. Uh, for uh, decades, we were using double pigtail stents. Uh, this has now evolved to using metal stents, initially tubular and now uh, lambs. Now there have been uh, numerous anecdotal case series reporting on the results of plastic stents and metal stents, both tubular and lambs. But we really want to focus on randomized controlled trials. So far we have only one, but there are two others that I'm aware of that are in the works now. This study from the Florida group showed an unsuperiority of lambs over plastic sense for drainage of walled off necroses with no significant differences in success, hospital stay, total procedures, or readmits. Lambs had more adverse events with a bleeding, significant bleeding uh, in three patients, buried lambs in two, and a biliary stricture in one. Lambs were more expensive, but the lambs were quicker in procedure time, 18 minutes versus 42 minutes. And I think this has uh, driven the use of lambs uh, uh, for pancreatic fluid collection. You need to look at the fine print in these studies comparing the lambs group and the plastic stent group, you'll note that more than three times as many patients in the plastic stent group had nasal cystic catheter irrigation. So 31% versus 10% in the lambs group and nearly three times as many had undergone percutaneous drainage and irrigation in the plastic stent group, 16% versus 6%. So this is really not a strict apples to apples uh, comparison. So I mentioned two multi-center RCTs that are uh, in the works here, one from Spain and the other from China. Uh, many open questions to be answered, is bigger better, uh, 20 versus 15 millimeter? Should we place multiple lambs? Uh, is that better than a single? Should we place a pigtail within the lambs? Uh, many arguments uh, for, but also potentially against that. And when should we remove the lambs. Let's turn to debridement now, and this can be divided uh, into indirect debridement, which is irrigation or direct debridement. This is necrosectomy. Indirect uh, irrigation can be performed through a nasal cystic catheter or percutaneous a catheter. Necrosectomy can be performed endoscopically where we pass the endoscope directly into the uh, fluid collection can also be done surgically by VARD or laparoscopically. The LAMS provides a port for direct debridement so we can pass our scope directly into the cavity and then using various tools, which we've borrowed uh, from uh, our luminal and uh, biliary endoscopy procedures uh, off the shelf and off label um, for, uh, to enable necrosectomy or direct debridement. Now you will note that each of these uh, has sharp tips at the end, which is why I'm not in favor of using uh, these, the dormia basket or a snare uh, or uh, a net because the wall contains uh, vessels and this can result in bleeding as well as perforation. I like to target the loose debris and my favorite approach is to attach a cap at the tip and to use a rat tooth forceps to remove only loose debris. So here you can see the cap attached at the tip. We can suck in the non-adherent necroses and pull those out. And you can also use the rat tooth forceps to chop up the necroses and pull these into the cap, and this makes the procedure much safer. We also have now uh, a new tool uh, for powered endoscopic debridement, a motorized tool that enables mechanical necrosectomy. It's a non-thermal platform. The principle is to suck in the tissue, cut it, and then remove the tissue. 
there's an inner rotating blade here combined with vacuum that sucks in the necroses. Uh, this is an automated system with a vacuum that auto adjusts with tissue contact and it is self uh, irrigating. Uh, so this is a very promising modality. You can see an example of how this is used called the endo rotor. You can see the window here uh, with the rotating uh, blade and we basically glide over the surface of the uh, necroses. Uh, so the tissue is pulled into that window, which makes this uh, very safe. And you can see the irrigation that is occurring as we remove the necroses. Now this still takes a bit of time, uh, but it improves the safety and really makes the procedure much easier for the operator. A few words now to the step-up protocol introduced by the Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group. Uh, it is becoming now, I think, the standard uh, in our management of PFCs. Uh, the decisive trial was published in 2018, the tension randomized controlled trial uh, from Europe. And in this trial, endoscopic step-up was uh, compared to surgical step-up in patients with infected necrotizing pancreatitis. So the first step is uh, irrigation and drainage. So endoscopically, this was performed with two plastic stents and placement of a nasal cystic catheter. And the surgical group underwent percutaneous irrigation and drainage. And then only if patients required direct debridement did they undergo necrosectomy and this trial found that nearly 50% 50 50 of patients could be successfully treated with irrigation alone. So there wasn't any need for direct necrosectomy and favoring endoscopic drainage were fewer pancreatic fistulas. In fact, the only fistulas were in those patients that required percutaneous drainage and shorter hospital stay. There's the second trial from the US now, randomized controlled. This is slightly different though, in that it compares a modified endoscopic step-up approach with endoscopic drainage only. So no irrigation using either plastic stents or lambs in about 50% versus minimally invasive surgery. So these patients did not undergo irrigation first, they went right to surgery. But again, here we see that the success rate for stent drainage alone was very high at 56%. So about half of the patients will not require direct necrosectomy and with the results favoring the endoscopic approach. So our take home messages from the step up trials is drainage alone successful in up to 50% of patients perform necrosectomy only if drainage alone fails. And the choice of drainage route would depend on the anatomy and the local expertise, the patient's anatomy, the cyst location. Uh, but uh, all things being equal, we would favor endoscopic due to the lower risk of a pancreatic fistula formation. So in summary, how do you treat if it's a pseudocyst without any necroses, a lambs only, or you can place a couple pigtail stents. I like to perform US at two weeks. I won't even do a CT scan because most of these will nicely resolve and then we can remove the lambs. For a walled off necroses with minor necroses, I will place the lambs only, it could be a 15 or a 20, and get a CT or US at three weeks and then remove the lambs if the collection is resolved. For one with major necroses, so more than 30% necroses, or infected necroses, I use a 20 millimeter lambs, I add irrigation, or I'll do weekly debridements until clean if uh, a nasocystic catheter is not an option for irrigation. And all patients, I stop PPIs, I keep them on antibiotics, and I start enteral feeding immediately because these patients are in a catabolic state. So again, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this year's hybrid SGI. Ken, very nice talk, as always. So it's a common but very important question, like our topic. When do you ask to the interventional radiologist for one patient? That's an excellent question. 
and so appropriate for this meeting because we want to work interdisciplinary in partnership with our radiology and our surgical colleagues. So this must always be a team approach. I can't emphasize that enough. And we present these cases in a forum like a tumor board. Um, so the, the radiologist plays a very important role in two scenarios. And the first is when we have these fluid collections extending remotely from our window, the GI tract window, either the stomach or the duodenal bulb. Those are the two locations that we can access the fluid collection. So if it extends into the Per, per, paracolic gutter, for example, or the pelvis, clearly this is territory for the radiologist. But the second reason is if we have infection or a lot of necroses, I don't hesitate to ask the radiologist to place in addition to the endoscopic transmural drainage, a percutaneous drain, which actually is not so much for drainage, it's for irrigation. So it's for irrigation infusion of fluid so that we have a closed circuit and we're constantly flushing out the necroses. Because otherwise we have to place a nasal cystic catheter, which patients don't like. So those are the two situations where our radiology co colleagues come to the rescue for us and help us. Very clear Very message. Good. Thank you. And now we'll move to the next topic. Okay, uh, let me introduce the second speaker. Uh, Excellent. Uh, what? Those are just incredible cases. So there's <laughs> so much that we can talk about and discuss. Um, and I think we've got um, at least 10 minutes of uh, time. Uh, so maybe we can look at some of the questions that you posed and uh, have uh, the, uh, the panel uh, address each of these. Can you go back to case one with the questions for a discussion? I think one of them, for example, for case one was the, uh, the role of, uh, of radiology um, or what should be the first step to manage a hemorrhagic pancreatic fluid collection. Uh, this is something we don't uncommonly see. And so I think the first question would be, is this something that we should first send to the radiologist? Maybe I can ask Dr. Moon and Dr. Chunk, how do you manage a hemorrhagic pancreatic fluid collection? What's the first step? So in my opinion, as I told you, as you told, told, told it, it's a unusual case that kind of, it looks like a very clean, just the usual should assist. So Dr. Joe did it very well. And just one, I think maybe two, two caster, two double pig tail caster will be better than one, but they did a very nice work and patient did the hemorrhage. Usually, like the same with Dr. Joe, we ask to interventional radiologist about the embolism, embolization. So uh, it may be the, just the first step to ask to the interventional radiologist. Would you agree, Dr. Chung, as yeah, well? Yeah. Yeah, Radiology yeah. address the underlying cause? Yeah, yeah. First. Usually, the, uh, in case of the pancreatitis, we encountered the active bleeding from the artery. So in that case, we, uh, it is easy to control. We can uh, do the angiography and find the bleeding focus and embolize it. But in this case, it is not, I think it is not that from the uh, active bleeding from the artery, maybe oozing from the venous or small branches. So in this case, I think, uh, is very difficult to control by the interventional radiology uh, with the embolization. But you would agree that we should at least send to the radiologist to 
evaluate and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, determine yeah. you know whether the severity of the bleed and whether it's arterial or venous. Um, so I think the, the other question we, we you have basically with clot in the fluid collection, it's at least in this case, uh, presumably sterile because the patient didn't have fever, chills, high white count. So assuming that it's sterile, should we intervene and try to drain these at all? Or is it better to do a watch and wait, manage conservatively? For me, second option. Usually, luckily, it's resolved spontaneously, but there, as you know, that kind of hemorrhage debris can make another second infection. And then definitely we need the luminal prism laser stenting. Yeah, so I feel quite strongly that uh, once we intervene, whether it's done percutaneous or endoscopically, we have contaminated the wand. And in this case, a hemorrhagic cyst can become very quickly an abscess. So I think we have to have some form of irrigation because otherwise you're gonna get stasis. And so in a way I feel the advantage of percutaneous is that one can irrigate. Endoscopically, we'd have to place a nasal cystic catheter. So one option would be like a lambs plus nasal cystic catheter so that the clots can be washed out. Or the other option is place a lambs because I think you need to get the clots out and place a percutaneous catheter for irrigation. And then you can actually irrigate also with hydrogen peroxide to help break out, break up the clots. So that's, that's how I've been managing these hemorrhagic cysts that require intervention because usually because either, you know, the patient has so much pain or because the collection has already become infected and they have fever chills. So let me have a one question to Dr. Joe. You did, for first case, you did the US drainage and then ERSP guide transpapillary stenting simultaneously yeah. from the beginning. Yeah. Is it your routine procedure or some special re reason for this patient? I'm, I'm wondering, the, uh, I want to uh, evaluate the disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. It's not a clear review on the MLCP. So, and, and yes, it, this is the main reason. And the second reason is a, some, a kind of uh, insurance problem uh, for, yeah. So Ken, can I ask the same one? It's a usual question from endoscopy. So when do you do ERSP guided transpapillary drainage in patient with pancreatic fluid collection? So I rarely do it. And really the only time I see an indication would be if there's a question of disconnected duct. And then my hope is that I may be able to reconnect the ducts and place the stent. So um, I, I don't really see much of a role for transpapillary drainage or, or for doing an ERCP. If you do an ERCP at the time of your drainage, typically you're going to have a high grade stricture, if not an obstruction, because the cyst is compressing the duct. As soon as the cyst drains, the fluid collection resolves, then that extrinsic compression on the duct will resolve. No different than the case that we heard about where it sounds like the patient ended up with a gastric bypass procedure, but, um, you know, really it's a duodenal bypass because of the stricture, but the stricture was caused, I think, by the fluid collection. So um, I'm not sure that, that, that a bypass really w was necessary. At any rate, I think that you need to be uh, cautious because when you do ERCP, you may, of course, have the complication that we all fear, which is a potential exacerbation of the pancreatitis, which caused the problem in the first place. 
Okay, any questions from the audience, from our room, to these cases? During waiting, Ken, you saw the second case. Could you do US-guided gastrogenostomy for this patient with heart issues? Is it indicated or not? Yes, I think that would be a good indication for it. Obviously, with the proper expertise and experience, but um, this would be a far lesser invasive alternative. And also, with the advantage that if the anatomy normalizes at a later time, then uh, you know you could just pull pull the axios after after the fistula matures you could just pull the axios or the lambs out. So whatever lambs you use. So I, I think this is a, a, a good indication for the lambs. Would you agree, Dr. Moon? Definitely. <laughs> and, 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 and a spaxis would be, a, would it be a great option, would it not? It's, uh, obviously, hot axios is better than for that indication. So, Doctor, did you do have a plan inserting lamps for second case? Uh, I I cannot think that, uh, but uh, I think it's a very good option. But and with uh, on uh, on the discussion with the uh, surgery department, multifocal world of necrosis can uh, uh, it, it it can be a hurdle or obstacle for a proper surgery. So on uh, EUS the multifocal or the necrosis is also the same problem, I think. So it is a hurdle, I think. Uh, in, in second case, you said that uh, you removed the necrotic dish uh, with the uh, percutaneous roots. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, material do, did you use to remove the uh, necrotic dish? Only basket? Yeah, only basket, but uh, I did in the, I don't, uh, you don't know, yeah. do in my hand. So, but on medical record and images, uh, baskets. How many sessions uh, did you uh, do? Two, two sessions. Which two, it, only two it, sessions. Yeah, each consists of more than ten uh, 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 basket. Very, very tough second case. So you did the uh, US guide drainage with just a simple plastic stand in. Yeah. Uh, less than three weeks. So okay. at that time, did you think about using a middle stand like a uh, lamb and yeah, other conventional it, it's method? It's a very good option, but I think uh, it is uh, the, I think the, the, the site of the uh, location of the world of necrosis is uh, the, the below the, uh, the stomach. So uh, it is uh, more uh, better uh, for PC loot because a uh, natural drain is, uh, uh, is not possible, I think, uh, this, uh, gr due to gravity. Uh, so, uh, PCD is more uh, uh, better, I think. And it, it, is, uh, it was a complicated case, so uh, another uh, endoscopic procedure is uh, hard to decide. Okay, Ken, as a last, could you do some home tech message to, for our session? as a closing remark? Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, what, what the LAMS offers is a, in addition to a larger lumen for drainage, which has obvious rationale, but more importantly, it serves as a port that allows the endoscopist to enter into the cavity so I think this first case, what was so incredible was um, this, or this case that was presented about uh, the, uh, the patient found to have an adeno, I think it was, was a, it was a cancer at any rate, correct? That first case. Yeah. Now, you have to wonder, it's routine for me after placing lambs to always go inside and at least evaluate the cyst cavity because I get so much more information about the necroses. There are different types of necroses. There's 
you know, that sticky, gooey, chewing gum-like necroses. And then there's other types of necroses that are more solid and loose that are definitely more amenable to removal. Um, but I think very importantly, and we should never forget that a patient with a neoplastic cyst can present with pancreatitis. And so we shouldn't think that the presentation with pancreatitis and a fluid collection equals pseudocyst or WAN. We should always think about the possibility of a neoplastic cyst. And I think the best way to evaluate for that is direct endoscopic inspection of the inside of the cyst. That's an important take home message from case one, because this patient was missed, misdiagnosed really, and therefore mistreated. So I, that was my take home on this, take advantage of LAMS as a port to extend the reach of the endoscopist. Very nice. That's could you, could you very, very nice, very nice. Okay, finally, could you wrap up our session? <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to. This is a wonderful example of how interdisciplinary collaboration has advanced our management of walled off necroses so marvelously. And I, I can honestly think of no better poster child why a meeting like SGI is so important as we move into this next era of minimally invasive intervention. It doesn't matter what approach you take and what tools you use. What is important is to bring these disciplines together working as a team. And you saw that illustrated so beautifully in our presentations today. So thank you to all for joining to us. My thanks to my co-chairman, Dr. Moon and Dr. Chung. And uh, I very much enjoyed our case-based discussions to give it some real practical meat. Thank you. Thank you, really appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you. We'll close our session.